special thanks to Dr. Sanjay Kumar for asking me here. Uh, we have a very eminent panel, so my job will be to just raise questions and the, the panel is going to tell us everything. I don't need to detail much. The idea of this uh, panel on HCC is that at the end of this presentation, we have 45 minutes, I guess uh, the organizers want us to do it faster than that. So we'll try to do it in 30, 35 minutes. The idea is there is a new classification for HCC. It's been proposed in 2022 in BCLC and then it has been revised by us as in NASAL in 2024. By the end of the presentation, all of us should be well versed with this classification and try to t treat your patient based on that because it's a very simple classification, we'll go through this. So I have a few slides uh, with the permission of the panel to give a background and then we'll go on to the cases. May I sir? Yeah. So this is what it looks like, very complicated slide. HCC has been divided into five stages. Let's not be uh, discouraged by this. We'll simplify this and then come back to this slide again and see whether it makes sense to us or not. Before we go there, when we are talking about managing HCC, we need to classify the HCC into various categories and for that we need three steps. One is diagnosis and characterization of the tumor. Second is staging and prognostication and third is treatment. So treatment is the final part. So only once you are able to classify them into various categories, you can decide the treatment. So how do we characterize the tumor? The first thing is you diagnose it by a cross-sectional imaging. You either need a triple five CT or a dynamic MR. Mandatory for diagnosis, you don't diagnose ultrasound on uh, uh, HCC on the basis of a ultrasound. You do a cross-sectional imaging as in a triple face CT or a MR. Before deciding treatment, you also need to make sure whether the patient has meds or not. So you have various ways to do it. Either you combine a HRCT with a bone scan or nowadays we do PET. I guess PET is available everywhere nowadays. So a PET CT with a triple flaze liver is a standard thing to classify your patient whether it's a metastasizing or not because the treatment options change. And finally, biological behavior, it has a lot of bearing on treatment for these patients. So a three centimeter HCC with the alpha phytoprotein of 10,000 is a completely different connotation from a 5 cm HCC with a normal AFP. The biological behavior is defined by AFP, PIVCA, and nowadays the new kidney on the block is PET avidity. If your tumor is PET avid, it's a more aggressive tumor. If the tumor is non-PET avid, it's a slightly less this thing. So that's based on which the, most of the classifications are done. So to stratify, to stage the tumor, you need to know the size, the number, the lobes involved whether it has a capsule, whether it's a diffuse infiltrative tumor, AFP and PIVCA, I've talked about that. Then most important thing, you have to have the, the liver synthetic function status of these patients. CTP and MEL score serve it well and nowadays we have a LB score which combines albumin and the CTP. Uh, we need to understand that also and finally performance status. And Please understand that we have very limited treatment options. We can divide our treatment options into curative and palliative. Let's remember this slide because everything will be based on this. Curative options are only three. Ablation, as in either radio frequency or microwave, a hepatic resection, or a liver transplant. Everything else, whether it's TACE or TEAR or SBRT or systemic therapy is palliative. You are not curing the patient with these medications. I have written sorafenib in brackets because nowadays we don't use sorafenib, although it is recommended as a first line therapy. So we use lenvatinib. So TACE, TEAR, SBRT, immunotherapy, lenvatinib all are palliative. There are only three curative therapies. So with that background, let's go on to, okay, basic concept of treating HCC. Either you cure the HCC or you use palliation to get it into a stage where you can cure it. So that is the philosophy of treating HCC. You cannot, only palliation is going to add a few months. You'll remember the sorafenib, the lenvatinib trials. They'll give you four months, six months survival advantage. Same for immunotherapy, one year survival advantage. So idea is to downstage it to a place where you can actually offer cure. So let's try and see the simplified classification. The five stages I've tried to combine them into three. There is one stage zero, which is less than two centimeter tumor. That's single, less than two centimeter tumor. That's a very, very early stage HCC. You have stage D, that is terminal stage. Now, what we, what is important to understand is stage zero, A, B, and C. Four out of five stages are defined by the liver function status. 
So where you are offering any treatment except transplant, you need to have preserved liver functions. That means CTP A6 or maximum B7. Your lenvatinibs, your immunotherapies, your TACE, your SBRTs are valid if your patient is well preserved liver functions. If the patient is terminal stage D, none of these are valid. So please remember, preserved liver function test patient is the one where you are offering all the treatments which are available. So I am finishing the terminal stage D here. I will ask uh, Prashant to talk about this. Prashant, if you have deranged liver functions, no matter what the size of the tumor is, would you offer a transplant or would you uh, stay away from it? So how would you decide whether you can offer a transplant in a decompensated liver disease patient? So I think uh, this is a very important point because if you look at the PCLC staging system that we've been following for two decades now with whatever modifications they've made, they put a patient who is stage D, that means someone who's got decompensated cirrhosis, straight away to palliative treatment or best supportive care. That means they would just say, you know, do whatever you can do to make the person's life better. Whereas most of the patients whom we are transplanting for HCC are going to have cirrhosis, which is going to be decompensated. So ultimately, patients whom we are going to transplant are going to be those patients who have advanced cirrhosis, and they developed the HCC primarily because they had a bad liver. Bad liver. True. Ninety percent of the tumors, the HCCs, will come in a patient who has a bad liver. Therefore, if you are not to transplant these particular patients then you are actually going to not be able to transplant any of these patients because then you are going to talk about doing a radiofrequency ablation or a microwave ablation in very small tumors. In intermediate stage HCC, you will say these are multifocal HCC, so I don't want to transplant them, they are outside criteria. So actually, the bulk of the population that we are transplanting for HCC today is those who have decompensated cirrhosis exactly. and they have a tumor. Thanks. To answer so, your question, whether to transplant them or not, I think we have to go back to the selection criteria perfect. for the HCC. Perfect. So, so, very simply put, if you have deranged liver function, the only treatment you can offer them is a transplant. Otherwise, basic supportive care is what is recommended. Your TACEs, TEARs, SBRTs, microwaves do not apply to a patient who has a CTP score more than 7. You can't do that safely. So, either transplant or nothing. That is where it stands when you have a decompensated liver disease patient who's got a CTP score more than B7. So that's where we end on terminal D. This is more interesting. Stage 0 and stage A, the first two stages we talked about, we have a less than 2 centimeter HCC and we have an early stage HCC which is basically within Milan criteria. You have either a single lesion less than 5 centimeter or three lesions less than 3 centimeter. You have a plethora of options here. Let's try and go to the case. So that's case number one we are discussing. 55-year-old diabetic male with social drinking habits, diagnosed as cirrhosis when he had hematemesis in 2011. No history of jaundice, no ascites. Bilirubin is 1.4. Albumin 3.5, INR 1.3. So if you calculate the score, it would be A5, A6, depending on whether you take 3.5 albumin as 1 or 2. So he's well compensated child status A. We do a baseline cross-sectional imaging for everybody whom we diagnose as cirrhosis and this is what you see, a 1.82 centimeter HCC. You can appreciate the arterial enhancement in the arterial phase and you can see the washout in the venous phase. So that's a classical HCC with a normal alpha phytoprotein based on diagnosed on radiological imaging. So cryptogenic cirrhosis, small HCC, eradicated varices, performance status zero, Child status A5, A6, MEL score of 11. Here we have all curative options available. We can do ablation, we can do resection, and we can do transplant. I will not offer TACE or TEAR or SBRT to this patient because I will remind you they are not curative, they are palliative. So let's talk about that. Uh, Dr. Kalla, if you get a patient like this, 2 cm HCC, child status A, you have three options to choose from, three yes. best options to choose from, what would you do? Yeah, we have data on this, like we compare with the radiofrequency ablation or hepatic resection. See, the one-year and three-year mortality is more or less comparable to both of them. But when you compare five-year mortality, the hepatic resection fares better. But wherein if you go into the complications of doing hepatic resection, then uh, the RFA fares better there. 
So it's a debated issue, but theoretically, long-term survival uh, resection fares better. Okay. So uh, thank you. So that's that's quite clear. Uh, for any comer, small tumor, RFA and resection are similar results. Uh, I would request Amar to talk about this. He has been doing RFAs and microwaves for a long time in these patients. So would it make a difference if it's a 2 centimeter lesion or a 4 centimeter lesion in your choice? Yeah, definitely. That's very important and interesting. So any lesion, 2 centimeter or less, the chances of A0 ablation, like uh, ablation where we have an adequate margin and we are sure that there will be no recurrence adjacent to the ablated area in La in three years so less than two centimeter has always a chance of no recurrence a zero ablation whereas as so soon as you move beyond three centimeter the chances of local recurrence at the ablated side around the ablated side keeps on increasing whatever and even the microvascular invasion increases with the size and if you go to the literature of hcc the size of the hcc is the single important criteria which will de determine the invasiveness so a smaller lesion better result as far as surgery and RFA, I think we have the answer, but still, uh, I think with newer modality and a better ablation zone, uh, probably the data what is available is the older data. In newer data, we'll see that the recurrence rate are still better uh, in uh, a, a comparable in a microwave ablation and resection group. So, so probably uh, smaller lesions, uh, ablation may be a better option. Still, we don't have a good RCT, but yes. So, so RCTs are very difficult to come by, especially we saw in the last debate, we have hardly have RCTs, but data is clear. If you take all tumors less than 5 centimeter, the one year and three year survival, as Dr. Kalla told you, are similar when you do a hepatic resection versus a radiofrequency ablation or a microwave ablation. But when you choose them to be less than three centimeter, even five year survival is similar and the complication rates are lower. So all of us tend to offer microwave ablation over resection in a tumor size which is less than three centimeter. Uh, 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 Dr. Prashant, what would be your choice? Would you consider a hepatic resection and when would you consider it? So I think today we are moving more and more towards minimally invasive resections and whether it is a final stop or whether it is like the initial stage to uh, treat a patient with resection and then later on if it recurs to go ahead for a salvage liver transplantation there is data now to show that a minimal access either laparoscopic or a robotic resection is going to give you the same results or in fact as good results as transplantation I'll talk about that a little bit later because you would probably rule out transplantation in these patients but less than he three knows me so well he's a dear friend so he knows what i'm going yeah. to say after this <laughs> so, slide <laughs> so less than three <laughs> centimeters probably i would not think of a transplant but between three to five is a gray area mm -hmm. so to answer your question if it was an hcc which is less than three centimeters located in a peripheral area of the liver which is easily accessible to a resection for example the segments of the liver six seven two three and it is a not a deeply located tumor then I would prefer to go ahead with resection in these patients. So Dr. Anand, uh, can I ask you a question? Now Prashant wants to cut this patient and take the liver out. Would you think of anything else before you offer a section to this patient? We'll need to check the HVPG in this patient because uh, long-term results are dependent on whether portal hypertension is present or not present. Okay. If the portal hypertension is not there and HVPG is less than 10, the results of resection would be equally good. So, so that's a very important message before you're offering resection. See, let, more than five centimeter lesion, that's a different topic altogether. We are not even going there. So that is a debate between resection versus transplant, not RFA and uh, microwaves. But if it's less than five centimeter and you think about resection, which you will do when the lesion is between three and five, you have to consider portal hypertension. Presence of portal hypertension makes the results of surgery inferior if you're doing a major liver resection, not a wedge. So if, uh, let me qualify uh, what Prashant said. If it's a peripherally located lesion, you would do a wedge. You will not do a, uh, uh, a major hepatic resection. But if it's a centrally located lesion, you will probably rule out if there's portal hypertension. So portal hypertension is a very important parameter. The best way to do it is HVPG. A simpler way is do endoscopy. If you find varices, your HVPG is more than 10. 
If you don't find varices, then you do HVPG to see whether the patient has portal hypertension or not. Can we go back to the slides again, please? Can somebody get the slides? Okay. So beyond size is presence of portal hypertension, and this is something I want all of you to remember. Two parameters, HVPG and bilirubin, will help you tell whether this resection is safe or not. If HVPG is less than 10 and bilirubin less than 1, excellent survival with surgery. Bil HVPG more than 10, bilirubin more than 1, very poor survival. This guy has a HVPG more than 10. Why? Because we did an endoscopy and the varices were there. So we know that the HVPG is more than 10. And bilirubin, I told you, was 1.3. So he's not a good candidate for surgery. Anyway, it's a small lesion. RFA would do very good. I would choose RFA. So in early HCC with preserved liver function, so I'm reiterating what I told you in the beginning. Preserved liver function is the bottom line. If you have preserved liver function, you can offer everything. If you have deranged liver functions, only transplant. So in preserved liver function, early HCC, as in stage 0 or stage A, aim for cure always. You can choose between ablation, resection, and transplant, depending on the size and number of lesions and presence of portal hypertension. But as Prashant predicted what I'm going to say, liver transplant may not be considered as a first-line option for early HCC, but only as a salvage therapy for tumor recurrence. It gives you equivalent survival. We don't, as a policy, don't offer transplant upfront in these patients, unless, of course, the tumor size is larger than 3 or 5 centimeters. That gets us to stage B. So stage B again is divided into three separate categories here. Sorry, uh, some. Uh, so multinodular tumor with preserved liver function. Again, I am underlying preserved liver functions. So you can divide them into three categories. One is within extended criteria. Now Milan is a classical criteria. Across the world, UCSF is, has become more accepted. It is more accept this thing. But people have different criteria. So Japanese would do up to 10 tumors, up to 10 centimeter. Uh, Prashant would downstage any tumor. Same with, uh, with us. We will try to downstage any tumor into the criteria. But generally, UCSF is the one which is followed most often and most commonly accepted. So if you have extended criteria and stage B is there, you still offer a transplant. In well-defined nodules, you offer a re local regional therapy, as in you block the artery, you do tear, you do a taste. The problem arises in diffuse infiltrative bilobar involvement tumors, where the BCLC says only systemic therapy. In Inasal, we say you can also include local regional therapy in the Inasal classification, because only systemic therapy does not help these patients. It does not help you go for any this thing. But again, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, the idea of treating the farther tumors, stage B, stage D, is to bring them down to a stage where you can offer cure, because any of these treatments do not offer cure to these patients. So you do taste or tear to downstage. You do systemic therapy with local lo regional treatment to downstage and offer them transplant. But what all classifications don't talk about is larger tumors, what is the role of surgery? Again, this is a completely different topic. I don't want to confuse the audience here. I'll just go on to the next case. So this is a case which we uh, saw a few years back from Uzbekistan, 52-year-old male, hepatitis B cirrhosis with HCC, referred for liver transplant. He specifically came with the idea that transplant has to be done. Now, this is an 8-centimeter tumor high AFP. You remember I told you the prognostic criteria are size, number of lesions, and biological behavior, which is defined by AFP. So this is a very high AFP. MEL6, ATP, CTP A6, grade 2 varices, so portal hypertension. So uh, Dr. Prateek, would you do a up, upfront liver transplant or consider downstaging in this patient? So I, I, the PET has been done. PET does not show any metastasis. It's a PET avid tumor with an AFP of 5500, 8 cm lesion. So yeah, I will go for downstaging the tumor. Okay. Because uh, when we offer taste in such settings, it can tell you the biology of disease. And second, it can uh, reduce it. It can uh, bring the tumor in purview of transplant also. So there is a, some data that if you have less than three tases involved with this uh, you're downstaging, then the chances of transplant success is much higher if you have more than three. 
so biology is you know it will give you a window and it will tell you the biology of the disease also which when uh, predict the survival and your transplant successful also amar how would you downstage this if you decide to downstage what would you use amar dr amar so yeah uh, here you know it's a 8 cm tumor is a gray zone again you may prefer tear over taste especially if a big lesion is big because in tear you are actually not embolizing if the word is known as trans arterial radio embolization but actually it is not an embolization you just inject, uh, inject a radioactive material into that area and artery remains patent and it gives you a much better only problem is the cost so if cost is not a constraint then probably tear is a better option but you know uh, if cost is a cost <laughs> so so let me highlight this again for the benefit of the audience the only situation where tear has been shown to be better than taste is large tumors more than 5 7 cm not 5 7 cm so 8 cm tumor is the only situation where tear is better than taste in most of the other situations tear and taste have similar results and cost of tear in our center is uh, taste in our center is 2 lakhs and tear is 15 lakhs so that's equivalent to a transplant cost you can decide for your patient okay so we decide to downstage with tear or taste uh, dr anand where would you like to downstage matlab what would be your end point of downstaging and where would you like to transplant the tumor must become transplantable that should be the end point of downstaging that means the size should become less uh, less than 5 uh, cm or so within the criteria uh, which within you follow UC so UCSF our center follows ucsf so i would like to be uh, in ucsf afp should come down yeah that's a very important and point so please remember even if the tumor decreases in size and the afp does not decrease that means that you are decreasing shrinking the tumor size but the afp is coming from somewhere else so you have to document a decrease in size of lesion and a decrease in afp and what is a significant decrease in afp is one log it is not 5500 se 5000 ho gaya 4000 ho gaya that's not a significant decrease one log is a significant decrease prashant how long would you wait so i think to add to what uh, dr anand also said and what you've mentioned i think the key here is what i'm probably going to say after 15 minutes after this uh, when i i talk about this is to look at tumor biology we are not looking any more at number and sizes now that's a thing of the past and that is why today in the bclc classification also for the first time transplant has come into intermediate stage hcc so this was never there before so it's important to note this is for the first time that we are talking about transplant in intermediate stage hcc that means beyond milan criteria in bclc and we've stressed on this in the inasal classification also and today we are also talking about something called stage migration that means you had a tumor which was outside criteria now based upon the alpha fetoprotein that's the tumor biology and the size we brought in within your transplant criteria and now from doing a taste or a tear you are actually going to transplant these patients exactly so, so you you, you should downstage to your criteria, your criteria which you are following so aim is to bring down the patient to a creative Can intent I sir please a question Uh, not only down stage but after down staging you have to wait for so that's time. a question i asked prashant actually prashant how long would you wait that's a question specific question to you so i think this question has been answered more in the ddlt scenario and there are unos criteria now which initially were waiting period of 6 months it's now down to 3 months and there are those who follow 2 months of waiting period also so i think you have to look at these cases on an individual basis if you are downstaging a tumor which is having an alpha fetoprotein of 5500 or 1 lakh when you started off and then you've come down to maybe 100 you will wait for 3 months if you had an alpha fetoprotein which was 250 and you had a tumor which was just outside your criteria you probably would not wait for that long before you fair go ahead enough. with the transplant fair enough so 3 months is the is the recommended waiting period in this case we didn't have that privilege because the patient has come from outside we waited for 6 weeks patient underwent taste not tear the afp decreased from 5500 to 500 we did a repeat ct ngo the lesion had come down to 3.5 cm he underwent a transplant 6 weeks later although as prashant very rightly pointed out 3 months should be the minimum criteria when you are looking at a very high afp patient but we did at 6 weeks but luckily for the patient he is alive and recurrence free at 6 years post transplant slides back again i realize the slides are not there so 6 years after transplant the patient is fine and good good for him 
So in intermediate stage HCC with preserved liver functions, aim for downstaging all patients except those who fit into your criteria. And taste, tear, and systemic therapy have the potential of downstaging. They are palliative treatments, not curative treatments. In intermediate HCC, you cannot offer microwave ablation or RFA with the intent of cure because they don't cure these patients, right? Finally, BCLC stage C. Now, I am trying to highlight what BCLC told us in 2022. They included all patients who had metastasis and all patients who had portable tumor thrombosis into one category and said that they should get systemic therapy. Systemic therapy as of now means atezolizumide plus bevacizumab or lenvatinib. I don't know how they gave that, what is the basis, but we in Inasal decided to reclassify that into two separate categories. One is extrahepatic spread or portal vein invasion with a poor performance status where you offer systemic therapy along with the local regional therapy. I don't know why they ruled out local regional therapy in these patients if the liver functions are preserved. And second category is portal vein invasion where you offer again combination of therapies with the intent to downstage and convert them into a curative category. That's what we do here. Oh, that we go on to last case. We still have eight minutes to go. 58 year old male resident of Myanmar. Hepatitis B related HCC, he was referred for liver transplant and this is a tumor. You can't see a separate nodule. You can see a diffuse infiltrative tumor with a portal vein tumor thrombus. You can see the portal vein filled with the thrombus and that is enhancing. So you have a large diffuse infiltrative HCC. Alpha fetoprotein is not very high as it is classically seen in patients who come from Myanmar. Uh, uh, Prashant will second me on that with a portal vein tumor thrombus which is VP3. VP3 means involving right portal vein but not extending onto the main portal vein. No extra hepatic metastasis. Dr. Kalla, would you try downstaging this patient? I and if yes, what would you consider a successful downstaging? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean the best thing here to, you know, let the audience know about it is the inacyl consensus you are saying this is the best thing which has happened, the 2024, the latest guideline, which has divided C, the intermediate stage, into 1 and 2. And uh, D is 1 is good for liver transplant if the liver is failing, otherwise go to systemic therapy. So that is something which we need to uh, present it in great detail. As for this question, we would like to downstage these patients and if they come back into eligibility, they go on to the surgeons or then back to the systemic therapy. So, so please remember that in diffuse infiltrative tumor, almost all therapies are suboptimal. No matter what you do, these guys have a very poor prognosis. The response to any type of treatment is poor. You try downstaging, but more often than you, not, you are unsuccessful in these patients. These are difficult to diagnose. I don't know how many of you have come across a diffuse infiltrative tumor actually missed on a CT and picked up on MR. Amar, can you, uh, can you put some light on that? Do you see that uh, missing a diffuse infiltrative HCC on a CT? So it's uh, uh, uncommon, but uh, not it is not uh, like it is not seen yes it is there mm -hmm. and many times it is like a very variegated kind of appearance and uh, you miss it on a uh, CT scan you just say it is a heterogeneously uh, appearing liver and when you do an MR you find that there is a watershed zone or there is an area which has a reticular pattern the other area appears a bit normal there is a portal vein thrombosis and there is a differential enhancement in arterial and a venous phase this is how you actually make out right. so these patients are actually there and uh, definitely as you say these are difficult to treat but having said that those patients who have preserved liver function and performance status zero should it at least be tried and you know multiple therapies should be given because it is still not unusual to see a response and recanalization of portal vein than so, believed. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Pratik, so, so this is a diffuse tumor you don't have a specific defined vessel so you can't offer taste and tear. So what in your clinical practice would you offer to these patients? He's a well-preserved, absolutely normal liver function test patient. Yeah, so uh, in such type of patients where you have a good performance status or a child of A or B, systemic therapies, as you correctly said, sorafenib in the beginning, now lenvatinib, and now we have uh, TKM, VEGF and uh, that Atizo combination, Beva in this, 
and uh, there is a IO IO combination as well. So these four options only we have. So Rafunib right now, although it is not given, but it is widespread uh, because of the uh, uh, this uh, low finances and other things. Uh, but definitely with the new combinations, we have uh, good uh, clinical radiological results and there is a better overall survival. So that is why that is four options we have for the so, so right. that's exactly what happened in this patient. So uh, we generally in a patient who has diffuse infiltrative, we don't offer taste or tear. Uh, either we use SBRT for both tumor and portal vein tumor thrombus or we use immunotherapy with SBRT and that's what we did in this patient. Dr. Manav, Doc can I just make one point? Yeah, please, please, that please. When you start with this patient, you have to know that the prognosis of this patient is it's very, very bad. So, so that's exactly what I mentioned in the first step. No matter what you do th for these patients, it is going to be an uphill task. The responses are poor for whatever you use. You can actually decide not to do anything, but that is not the, the patient is not going to understand that because he's a well-preserved liver function, incidentally detected at HCC, and he'll tell you, boss, I'm fine. How can you not treat me? So that's exactly what happens. But we have to understand diffuse infiltrative with portal vein tumor thrombus are the worst HCCs to handle for e everyone. So rather than downstaging, you try to do whatever is possible and what you by evidence know is going to give you best results. So what will you do, Prashant? So I would have done a tear and SBRT in this patient. Tear will not work. Uh, uh, well, uh, so again, I'll, I'll go back and ask you one question. What is the age of the patient and what is the etiology? 50, if it, if, hepatitis B. Yeah, so if he is a 30-year-old male, hepatitis B, in a non-serotic liver, I'll say the response rate would be very good. Having said that, in a 50-year and long-standing hepatitis B, the probably the uh, you know recovery may not be as good because we have seen young patients with a, uh, infiltrative HCCs responding much well to co combination of therapy. See, see, uh, uh, Dr. Amar, let's remember that 30-year-old and 58-year-old are two different categories. Had he been 30, I would have sent to Prashant for a resection if the liver volume was adequate, he despite a portal vein tumor thrombus and then gone on for a systemic therapy. In a 58-year-old who has varices, who has portal hypertension, you are, no matter what you do, it's going to be bad. Considering hepatitis B, patients have good response to immunotherapy. I offered a combination of uh, immunotherapy and SBRT. The tumor actually regressed, the AFP dropped. So this is the CT after three cycles of immunotherapy. That means almost two months later, the, there's a significant regression in the tumor and the portal vein tumor thrombus has become non-avid. We took a call, transplanted, and as the luck would have, as we would have predicted, on histopathology, there was viable tumor both in the portal vein as well as in the liver. Liver we had already seen, but the portal vein also had a viable tumor, and he recurred nine months down the line. So no matter what you do, the best possible therapy, these are difficult to treat patients. This guy came marked for transplant. We would not say take no for uh, this thing. He says, no matter what you do, I want to get the best treatment option. We offered it knowing that he'll probably recur and he did recur to not to anybody's surprise, only to the patient's surprise, but that's what happens. Pratik, you want to make a comment? I want to ask. Uh so, if, if uh, for the same patient only, uh, you upfront transplanted or you wait? No, 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 we waited for, we waited for three months, which is again a small period for a portal vein tumor thrombus because you have just given three cycles of therapy. After that, you have done a CT and after one month you have transplanted. Ideally, it should be six months, but again, there are pressures which you do. Yes, so, so, I am highlighting this case, how it should not be done. Not how, uh, I'm not trying to justify what we did. I'm telling you, it should not be done this way. So In an ideal world, I would not offer a transplant to this patient. I would say wait. So if a responding tumor, so he's, he's probably responded to the immunotherapy. So would you offer more therapy and a before transplant? It I agree, be I agree with you. So had I had the choice, I would have offered therapy for a year and then seen where, where he's going. But here is a patient who's come from outside country. He's after your life, boss. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. Why are you not transplanting me? I have more, don't have any more money to spend. So this is not how you manage diffuse infiltrative just to make it. Yes, sir. So I am ending here. Uh, before you end, just <coughs> one question uh, regarding case three. Diffuse infiltrative tumor on the right side, 
portal vein thrombosis, some metastatic nodules on the left side. No, 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 no metastasis on the left side. No, no, I'm asking okay. if this patient would have some metastatic nodule on the left side, would you offer any treatment or just leave him? So I would offer Ganges water TDS. <laughs> <coughs> Patients liver function are well preserved. You have to explain, this is a metastatic HCC sir. Yeah. So portal vein tumor thrombus with the other side involvement, a front transplant ruled out. Yes. All medical, you can still see, you can still follow this pattern. You can give systemic therapy and try to focus your SBRT on the portal vein tumor thrombus and hope for the best. If I have to do similar guy again, I would offer this, but not transplant at three months. I would probably send him home on immunotherapy, see after a year and... Even you would not offer a... I'm asking a very specific question. Diffuse on the right side. So, so it's on only liver side. involvement, no metastasis no, no outside. Metastasis. I would offer immunotherapy and SBRT okay. in the best intention and wait for a year. Okay, thank you. So one more quick question. <coughs> Once you have downgraded a tumor to within transplant criteria, whatever <coughs> you are following, and you are waiting for three months, is there any recommendation to wait for, uh, do interim AFP levels and you see that it is again skyrocketing, suggestive, aggressive tumor biology? Will you so, still so, so that's exactly what we talked about. You don't only look at the radiological decrease in the size, you also look at the biological behavior. If the AFP is high, AFP has to be documented to be low. The minimum time period, as Prashant pointed out, for any tumor for downstaging is three months. But if you have a more aggressive tumor, you want to wait for a longer period. So that's what I'm saying. So in the interim, if you have downgraded and the AFP comes to normal, and then in a sequential AFP levels, say three, four, five, it again shoots up 500, then 5,000. It's probably a more aggressive tumor. So then would you yeah. transplant at three months when the so radiological it's, it's, image is stable? It's a very hypothetical situation. I. I don't know, it will vary from patient to patient. You are treating the patient, you are waiting. Let's say after six months, the AFP starts rising slowly. Probably nobody would wait for six months actually. In, see, che mahine mein, if the response is good, AFP is coming down, you'll probably transplant. So it's a situation which you can't have answers uh, right over the counter. Dr. You understand Mahana. what I'm trying to say? Uh, is there any role of uh, looking at pivka as well? So, so AFP coming down, yeah, he's right. Uh, <coughs> but many times we see pivka also comes down, but not ac actually to the normal level. So, so would that pr predict? Ca can it give us uh, some answer, like uh, whether whether you would okay. go for so any that's, that's a So that's a very good question. AFP and pivka are two independent markers of biological behavior. If both are high, it tells you a more aggressive tumor. So AFP alone high. Pivka alone high and AFP and Pivka high are three different categories. Usually, if AFP is coming down, Pivka will also come down. AFP has well-defined cutoffs. Pivka does not have well-defined cutoffs. They vary from patient so, to patient so, and country to country. So if you allow me, I have just one comment to make. So we just uh, <coughs> did a study regarding this. So we <coughs> studied almost uh, 150 patients and we studied that those patients who have a normal AFP, normal response on CT, complete response is still high Pivka, not exactly coming down to normal. So it has come down from 50,000 to maybe 5,000, but not come. So those patients will have recurrence. So any patient so, will have so, so high, uh, one of the markers high. So, so, so combination of AFP and Pivka both high tells you it's a more biologically aggressive tumor. So that's exactly... Uh, so this is the final slide. We started on this slide. Can we go back to the slide? I'm finishing here. So can we now understand? Very early stage, small lesion, less than two centimeter, RFA, microwave ablation. Early stage, transplant versus local regional therapy, microwave ablation, RFA. Intermediate stage, you either transplant or you give systemic therapy with local regional therapy. Advanced stage, HCC, if you have metastasis, only systemic therapy. If you have portal in invasion, you can still offer systemic and local regional therapy and terminal stage transplant versus no treatment. So that's where we end. Thank you for your patience. I, I have a question. Uh, this is basically on the other end of the spectrum uh, regarding the uh, prevention of at risk patient with respect to molecular diagnostic therapies. Are there any set criteria in molecular diagnostics technique which are available for at risk patient, whether it could be Hep B, Hep C, or no, no, an right. FLD? Sorry, sorry, if I get your correction, uh, question correctly, 
molecular diagnostic therapies for Genetic diagnosis of HCC? Yeah, pre uh, preemptively diagnosing or like you know trying to. So, so there is a lot of work which is going on uh, liquid biopsies in these patients. There is a lot of work which is going on in detecting genetic mutations in exactly. the blood. That is what it I want. It is not. It is still an experimental thing. It is not available for public use. It is not even. Uh, it's it's only in research labs and that's also uh, in very few centers in the world. So as of now, we are nowhere close to it. Thank you. Thank you.